Gracious God, we are humbled to come before you on this day from many places and uniting uh, together in this place to seek to understand, to seek to learn, to seek to serve you more deeply. It is in your holy name that we pray. Amen. for the call to worship of all of the Abrahamic faiths. God who is blessed. Praise be our God now and forever.
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصل اللهم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يا أيها الناس إن خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. From this time on and forevermore, I lift up my eyes to the hills. This, this is the word of the Lord. Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. Well, good morning. On behalf of Bradley Hills Presbyterian Church, Bethesda Jewish Congregation, the Islamic Community Center of Potomac, and Adara e Jafariya Mosque, we welcome you to our annual interfaith service of worship. Our gathering reflects a heart of openness, curiosity, and commitment to understanding and connection. Let's begin our time together, if we could, by welcoming each other to this sacred service. Find someone you did not come to worship with today and say, welcome, I am glad you are here. <laughs> Matthew. Matthew, 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 Matthew. I didn't mean it, we'll talk more, it's all good, it's all good. Peace, peace, peace. This service was born out of the partnership between BJC and Bradley Hills, who have shared sacred space here for more than 50 years at 6601. 
We are grateful to partner with the ICCP and ADARA as well in so many ways. Our friendship is a beacon, I believe, and helps enliven and enrich and deepen each of our spiritual journeys. This worship service and the many mission and education and fellowship opportunities between and among our congregations are strong symbols of collaboration, desire for mutual learning, and witness to interfaith understanding and love which are solely needed in our world. During a divisive time in our history, we believe that it is needed now more than ever. Plus, it's always great to worship with good friends and to have a chance to make new ones. We welcome the many guests and those who have come to this place for the first time as well. We hope that folks will have a chance during the worship service to mark and pass the red fellowship pad so we can greet each other by name following the worship service. We're also delighted that today we'll include the new world premiere performance of a new musical piece that was composed by Joshua Fishbein. Where is Joshua here? Who's going to be Joshua? Thank you for your gifts and willingness to share them here as well. You'll see information about that piece, about the Sutherland Music Endowment at Bradley Hills, and in the music notes, I commend those to you to learn about the music that we're going to hear today. For Bradley Hills members, there's a sheet of announcements out in the narthex, as well as some information about BJC and BHPC announcements in the bulletin. But just note, generally, for all the congregations that are represented here, the spirit of this particular service of openness, connection, and love flows through the activities of all the communities that are represented here. We'll have a special offering today. You'll hear more about that later in the service. For Bradley Hills members, many have asked, yes, you can make your annual pledge or your regular offering this morning. The loose offering does go to the church and the church pledges can come forward. But if you would like to support the refugee project you'll hear about later, just write refugee in the memo line or put that on an offering envelope and place it uh, in the, in the, uh, when the baskets come around later in the service. And as you know, there's a brunch that follows this service down to the left of Memorial Hall. If you have uh, made a reservation, you go straight to Memorial Hall if you have already paid. If you have not have a reservation and still need to pay, you stop by uh, the library on the way down. As we mentioned, that is an opportunity for us to continue the conversation and the dialogue today. We invite you to sit with somebody there as well uh, that you did not come to worship with. Our Smart Sacks mission program will be in Covenant Hall, and you can stop by the lounge on your way to the brunch uh, to participate in our mission interfaith Thanksgiving basket mission project. And as always, members of the Islamic Community Center and of Adara will be our guests today for lunch. So friends, this is a most special service. We are glad that you are here to participate with us in it. And we are grateful for the opportunity to dialogue, to sing, to serve, to connect, and to worship together on this special day. I invite Diana to come forward to lead us now in a responsive reading. Salvation, whom shall I fear? One thing I ask of the Lord that will I seek after to live in the house of God all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. God, God will conceal me under the covers of God's tent. God will set me high on a rock. Service when the when we sing the next chorus, we invite children from all three faiths to join us on the chancel steps for a brief moment with children.
Good morning and welcome to all of the children. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Matt and I am the Director of Christian Education at Bradley Hills Presbyterian Church. Um, and today is our, annual, is our annual interfaith service. This, we've done this for many years, but this year we're going to do something a little bit different for you, the children. If you, listen up, if you are in first grade through seventh grade, then in a minute you are going to follow me as well as Miss Mindy from BJC, and we are going to do some really fun interfaith activities together. First through seventh graders from every congregation are invited to join us um, as we learn more about each other's faith. But if you're younger than first grade, if you're not in first grade yet, then you are going to go to your normal Sunday school class, your normal Sunday school class. So if you're in kindergarten or younger, you go to normal Sunday school. And at the end of the service, for everybody else in the congregation, stay right here, don't go away, because at the end of the service, we, the first through seventh graders, will have a very special treat for you. Um, so in a minute, I'm going to say the words, go in peace. And when I say those words, two things will happen. If you're in first grade through seventh grade, you'll follow me, and we'll go to an interfaith activity together. If you are in kindergarten or younger, you'll follow me, and you'll go to regular Sunday school, all right? And if you're in the congregation, and you're in first grade through seventh grade, you're also welcome. <laughs> to join us. We want uh, as many uh, as would like to join us to join us. All right, are you ready? Here we go. Go in peace. This morning, we read from the scriptures of our faith. We read from the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Bible, and the Quran, or the Hadith, uh, to be specific. Uh, I'll be reading this morning a, a story from the Torah of the reconciliation, or the first time we see the brothers Ishmael and Yitzchak together as they come to bury their father Abraham. This was our Torah portion this week, uh, which was read yesterday in our synagogues. Vayik peru oto yitzchak vayishmael banahav el ma'arat hamach pala el sede efron ben sohar hachitihi asher al pene mamre hasade asher kana avraham meet pene chet Shama kubar Abraham v'sara ishto v'yehi achare mot Abraham v'yivarech Elohim et Yitzchak beno v'yeshev Yitzchak im be'er lechai roi ve'ele todot Yishmael ben Abraham asher yalda chagar hamitzrim. Sivchat sadra le Abraham, ve'ele shemot bnei Yishmael, 
bishmotam letoldotam bechor Ishmael nevayat vekedar beat beel umiv shaham umisha udomaha umasaha hadad vetemaha. Yetor nafish v'kad maha Eile heim b'nei Yishmael V'eile shmotaham v'chatsrehem U'v'tirotam Shani masar nisim li'umataham the Elesh ne Haye Ishmael me at Shana Ushloshim Shana Vasheva Shanim Vaigva Vayamat Vayasef Elamav. And Abraham expired and died in a good old age, a man of full years and he was gathered to his people. And his sons buried him, Isaac and Ishmael, in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is in front of Mamre, the field which Abraham pur purchased from the children of Chet, there was Abraham buried with Sarah his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed Isaac his son, and Isaac lived by Bir Lahai Roi. And these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, who Hagar the Egyptian gave birth to, Sarah's handmaid to Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebaot, and Kedar, and Abdil, and Mibsaham, and Mishma, and Duma, and Masaha, Hadad, and Tema, Yetor, Nafish, and Kedem. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are the names of their villages and the names of their encampments, 12 princes according to their nations. And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he expired and died and was gathered to his people. I was following along in the book of Genesis, and it says the same. <laughs> Therefore, I will lift up from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 2. God shall judge between the nations and shall arborate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. This is the word of the Lord. When a student starts their course of uh, Sharia studies, they're typically taught one hadith as the first subject matter. And it's known as the hadith or the prophetic statement of mercy. And this tradition actually carries on, so as you grow older and as you meet a teacher, even if you're older and you're studied and all of that, the first thing that that teacher is supposed to give you is this same text. It's called the Hadith or the Prophetic Text of Mercy. And it says that the merciful ones receive mercy from the merciful one. Show mercy to all those on earth and you shall be given mercy from the one in the heavens. As a reminder that the whole reason for the course of study is to embody prophetic mercy. So I will recite for you the text. An Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu anhu maqal qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam 
الراحمون يرحمهم الرحمن تبارك وتعالى ارحموا من في الأرض يرحمكم أو يرحمكم من في السماء
invite our friends to come forward and sit. Joshua, that was magnificent. Thank you. And thank you. And, and thank you as well to those who uh, helped put both this and the brunch on, uh, the leaders of our intercongregational partnership. Many, many thanks. This dialogue here, which is meant to be the tip of the iceberg for our future discussion, will be a launching point for the discussions that we hope to have in the brunch following the worship service and in our own homes and in our own, in our own congregations around the topic of justice and the role that faith has to play. Now, some of you this week may be going to Justice League, the new Marvel comic, I believe, movie, which is the biggest movie opening this week, the Superman-Batman movie here. I see a young person in the front row nodding with it as well. The whole poster that I saw for this movie with all those superheroes is Justice League United We Stand. That was the theme. And I think there are three themes that sort of come out in that movie. First is justice. That's the whole reason these superheroes are together, to try to promote righteousness and the right way of being in a world where there is too much that goes wrong. Secondly, united we stand, that unity amongst that group is needed to defeat uh, the, that which is evil and which opposes it. And third, in the post-Superman world, this is getting a little specific with the movie, that hope is lost and that the unity and justice of these individuals can bring hope to a world where it is needed. Well, this morning, I'm sure you'll agree, we have a theological justice league here. <laughs> Once you work out who is Superman and the rest, but in any case... Well, you're obvious. <laughs> in any case... You must be Superman. <laughs> the, the thought here is that in our world, the ideas of promoting justice in a world where there is too much that is unjust, that there is unity among those who have come here today who see something special and sacred in the exp faith experience of somebody else, and that by unifying, we can provide hope in a world that desperately needs it. And boy, does our world ever need it. We think about the various divisions of our world. I look at Puerto Rico still fighting for power and thinking about the literally power as in the lights going on, and think about economic injustice. I note the swastikas on Jewish centers in Maryland and elsewhere, and immigration bans against predominantly Muslim nations, and think about discrimination that is too frequent. I think about shooters firing weapons in Las Vegas, killing 50 and injuring 525, and in a worshiping community in Sutherland Springs, Texas, just one week ago today. And I'm noted that America has four times the number of deaths by firearms, I believe, in Switzerland, which is the number two industrialized country in this sad statistic. I think of the revelations of sexual harassment and abuse and think about the need for justice in that space and the racism that was so poignantly explained or shown the light by Charlottesville this past August, where individuals who break my heart by claiming that their Christian faith in some ways motivated their racism helps bring up what we know too well that our world has too much which is unjust in it. And as we think about a time when too often our national dialogue and culture and politics seems divisive and exclusive and exclusionary, I'm sure you'll agree that there are a need for hope and justice in many corners of our world. And so I want to pose a question. I'll ask it first to Tarek and then for Sonny and for Corey, and we'll all begin our discussion today. Thinking about, given this pain and violence, bigotry and xenophobia, hatred and division that has occurred in the past year since we met back in this space, what can our faith traditions, given our histories and our theologies and our ideals, contribute to help people unite to counter such evils and to provide hope? So Islam has a very rich tradition about uh, times of tribulation. We call it al-fitan, you know, when, when things go bad, uh, what do you do? And, and, and it's sort of also related to sort of the messianic, you know, you know, concept that all of our faiths have. But one of the interesting things is that uh, when the Prophet, uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was addressing this topic, he said to his people, when, when things go bad, you have to hold to your community. And in other narrations, he said, or sometimes your community is just your family or your home. If things are you know, that bad that there is no community, you know, God forbid. But the idea is that we have strength in the community. 
And I think that when things go bad, uh, this is the time for us to double down on the community, our community, whether it's the church community or whether it's the interfaith community or whatever the, the communities are that we are a part of. The idea would be, you know, our ethical uh, value system would say we we're going to find strength in that, hold to one another, care to one another, be and strengthen. Because even though things look bad now, uh, you know, things always look bad in the past at one point or another. So whatever we do now, our children, they are going to inherit that world in the future. So we might as well invest in them now. I mean, that's what the, what the, the, the teaching is. Invest in the community now and in the, in the children now because they are going to go out there in the future and hopefully they'll do a better job than you know, we have, as it were. So that's one thing that comes to mind, the importance of community and doubling down and strengthening and building. Um, I, I said so much up on the lectern when I was reading text, I think Corey needs sure. to get her voice back. <laughs> right. <laughs> For me, um, one of my favorite scriptures is from the prophet Isaiah, um, chapter 58, where um, he's asking on behalf of God, is this not the fast that God chooses, but to loose the bonds of injustice, to let the oppressed break free and to break every yoke then your light shall shine your darkness become like the noonday and the ancient ruins will be rebuilt for me that is such a hopeful vision of what life can be what life should be um, God going before you and God being your rear guard and for me in times of tragedy and sadness it, you is the time to dig in deep to to work into like you said work um, go deep with your um, service um, breaking those bonds of injustice being a part of that work and for me that is what is is that is the time to to dive into it, to co-create this justice with God, seeking to be a part of God's movement in the world, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, offering shelter, and then our darknesses will be like the noonday. For me, I think it's a matter of what we focus upon within our traditions. Um, we all have to do a little mea culpa that historically all of our faith traditions, all of our religious texts have been used to support violence and xenophobia and war and persecution. So first of all, I think we need to ensure that we raise up a generation of clergy across all faiths who find the part of our text that support what is needed in the paradigm we live in. And that would be for inclusion, for communities that support each other and reach out to each other. I note that in my Torah, the most uh, oft-repeated commandment is to love the stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And yet I look at what goes on today in Israel and Palestine, and I see very clearly that is not the way a nation founded on Jewish principles, supposedly, lives out its creed. I see the same in other nations in the Middle East, and indeed we see rising nationalism and persecution even in majority Christian nations like Poland, Austria, Hungary. So, um, first of all, I think it has to start with leadership, but then I think it starts with you. Because you need to know the texts of our traditions well enough that when someone from your faith says, oh, the Bible says this, that homosexuality is an abomination, and then you have to also say, but I know in my text it says that God loves his creation. How could God hate something 10% of his creation? Her creation. Pronouns are another whole story. <laughs> um, so I think it's important for every one of us in all of our traditions to know what our texts teach, the breadth of it, not just the little slices that guys like us and girls like us give to you, but what is included in the text. And then if you know that, 
go read the other texts. Learn the Quran, the holy book that is held by so many billions of people as dear. Learn your Christian Bible. Know the Gospels, but also the Pauline letters, because in there you will find conflicting statements. You will find definitely portions that don't jive. And then you must bring your intelligence and your discernment and your wisdom to the text. Well said. It just the two things come to my mind just as an example out of the Christian context. Um, the, the most exclusive gospel writer people will lift up would, for instance, be John. Uh, Luke, very justice focused, relatively inclusive, but John is seen as often used as a bit of a hammer to be exclusive, very high Christology, so somewhat exclusive. Yet it's John who writes that God so loved the world, the whole world, the world that God created and said was good, that, Johnny, uh, that Sonny referred to as Genesis 1. And it's the revelation to John in Revelation 7 that lifts up this vision that before the Lamb are people of every language, every nation, every part of the world. And so a very inclusive vision if you know the totality of John. The same with Paul. Paul's often used his letters, as Sonny mentioned, to be exclusive. And yet it's Galatians 3 and Romans 10, two Pauline letters, where Paul specifically lifts up that in the vision for the world that there should be no slave or free, male or female, Greek or Jew, that all are one. And so Sonny's points, just to use those two examples, that even the most exclusive parts of the Christian Bible, one finds that when one really explores what Paul and John write, not to mention the others, there are important texts that then we can use, and I'm speaking to the Christian here, but it applies in every faith, to combat those who would do violence in the name of the religion. Those in Charlottesville, for instance, who do violence in the name of Christianity make it clear to me that they are making God in their own image and not recognizing and honoring the image of God in all. Our second question is a practical one, and it builds on what Sonny shared here, and maybe we'll start with Sonny since he went third, is getting into the practical nature of how we respond. What can we as congregations do uh, and those in our pews, in our rooms, in our discussions to follow to make a difference uh, individually or collectively in providing hope and help. Okay, we have in Yiddish a saying, Versprechen Tachlis, okay, which basically means I'm going to speak the practical. Whenever you hear a Jew say Tachlis, he's talking about the practical aspects of any given idea. So talking Tachlis, first of all, I think the thing that our faith traditions must do and this is a place where people get uncomfortable and they don't want to hear it from their clergy, but I think it's time that we start saying it. We got to get out and vote. Every one of you has to visit the ballot box. If you are not registered to vote, you are shirking your duty as a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew to build a better world. Get out, get registered, and vote. As we just saw in Virginia, when people of goodwill come together to combat against those who would divide us, who would hold up symbols of hatred, of racism, of slavery, and hold them as sacred to get people to the ballot box. We have to combat that. We have to counter that. We know there, are, as we saw in Virginia again, so many more people of goodwill who want an inclusive society. It's when we disengage that we commit the greatest sin. Mm. Because when we say, oh, I don't like her as a candidate, and we stay home, or I don't like him as a candidate, I don't like his tax policy, we let the racists win. And we are now reaping the fruit that we sowed back last November. Every one of us must take responsibility for our world. So one, I think it's time, as clergy, we don't have to support candidates. In fact, we shouldn't. But we should be encouraging every one of our congregants to do their civic duty, but also do their duty to God to build the world that will be the coming of the kingdom. We have a saying in the Zohar, in the Jewish mystical book of the Kabbalah, that the Messiah arrives one minute after he is no longer needed. <laughs> because we have already built a messianic world. Thank you, Sonny. Tark? So, uh, also to be practical, I think one thing that uh, from our tradition is uh, thoughtful gift giving. 
uh, the Prophet said, Tahadu tahabu, give gifts, exchange gifts with one another, you will love one another. And I think that whether it's within the community, an intra-community sort of gifts or gifts between communities, I mean, this service is a, definitely a gift, I think, for all of us that we've been able to, several years in a row, to have this, and we all look forward to it. But what ends up happening is when you exchange gifts, you know, you're exchanging feelings, good feelings, you're thinking about somebody, uh, and uh, it shows that, you know, they're on your mind. And then, it's, and then when you get a gift, you feel like, well, I, I should also give a gift, and you sort of, you, you, it's never ending gift giving, you know, you just end up giving gifts, and it could be foods, or it could be things, or it could, but it's thoughtful. It's thoughtful. I mean, how nice is it when you receive a gift and you never expected it? And it, it really spoke to you. Somebody said, you know, I was in this place and I thought of you. I saw this book or I saw this card or I saw this picture. I thought of you. Even if they send it to you as an image. I just, I saw this image. I thought you would really appreciate it. You're like, wow, they were thinking about me, you know. And, and, and then that sort of dissipates all of the tensions that might arise. So I think that one, one thing that we can do is we can start exchanging gifts as communities. And I think that that would be very you know, very thoughtful, and, and um, I, I'm sure that, that we will see that love sort of, you know, come. And I also want to second what Sunny said. I think that voting is also important, but I was just trying to be a little bit more, uh, I was just thinking about our, my own tradition. But yeah, we should vote and not endorse candidates. I'm all, I'm all for that as well. Thank you, Tara. Corey? I think um, for practical steps, um, one of the things that comes to mind um, is being not um, reading challenging books together, um, finding authors that um, are outside of your own uh, tradition, your own um, your own race, your own religion, your own socioeconomic class, because reading it um, helps uh, empathy. It helps you see from a different point of view, and that is very helpful. I think also not being afraid to recognize our own culpability in systematic problems of injustice, of racism. Um, and also, of course, I think both of, I, I love this idea of gift giving um, as uh, uh, strengthening that bond and friendship. And of course, voting and participating. But also I think something that Sunny had mentioned at the beginning, um, understanding our own faith traditions and claiming them well. I think this is something specifically for my generation. Um, there's a lot of people who lament um, younger people, millennials, I'm on the upper cusp of millennial, but I still claim it, um, <laughs> that we're not um, claiming the faith of our fathers and our mothers and our grandmothers in the same way. Um, and I think part of it is there's a sense, we see a sense of hypocrisy of danger, of harm, of speaking texts um, of scripture in one way and um, people acting and behaving in very different ways. And for me, when I was going through my um, faith uh, journey and eventually finding my way to the ministry, I decided not to turn away from the things that scared me about my faith, but dive into it, study it, learn it, and, and become a part of it and become a part of making the church more what it should be. This agents of justice and speaking those truths, not being afraid of the harm that has been done from my own tradition, but being a part of making it more what it should be and what God wants of it and of each of us. And so for each of us in this room, Christians strive to be better Christians. Muslims strive to be faithful. Muslims, Jews seek to be more devout and true in your own faiths. That is how we can um, be a part of this united strength justice league together. Well said, Corey. There's so much that that resonates with me in terms of specific issues, even the debate about whether or not everyone should be armed in church after Sutherland Springs. <laughs> If this is the vision on earth and heaven, is everyone in heaven going to be armed and therefore we should be armed in the pews, or is that very different? That exact piece of how the kingdom, whatever your faith tradition, plays out in the real world applies to specific issues. Mention the gift, what a gift this is. Thank you, friends, for sharing your wisdom. This is to spark conversation, and we'll look forward to continuing in the dialogue over brunch and into the future. <laughs>
kingdom that will be the world we wish to see in our time. But uh, I guess I chose the right song. So please join me in uh, a song of praise, but also a song of hope. Bayom Hahu. Bayom Hahu just means this day. That's what it means in Hebrew. The day, that day when we will all be one. There I am. Okay. This is the chorus. I am Hahu, and on that day I will wipe all tears away. Sorrow and pain shall all be gone, and my name it shall be one. I am Hahu, I am Hahu. Do that again. Join me. I am Hahu. And on that day, I will wipe all tears away. Sorrow and pain shall all be gone, and my name it shall be one. By Yom Hahu, by Yom Hahu. A day will dawn in the time to come, a day when God's name shall be one. All war and suffering shall all be through. When that day comes, by Yom Hahu, by Yom Hahu, and on that day I will wipe all tears away. Sorrow and pain shall all be gone, and my name it shall be one. By Yom Hahu, by Yom Hahu. Let justice and righteousness flow like a stream. The old and the young shall see visions and dreams, and what we dream shall yet come true. When that day comes, by Yom Hahu, by Yom Hahu, and on that day I will wipe all tears away. Sorrow and pain shall all be gone, and my name it shall be one. By Yom Hahu, by Yom Hahu. They shall not hurt or destroy in your holy place. Your nerd shall be known to the whole human race in their lips and their hearts, so they'll know what to do when that day comes. By Yom Hahu, and on that day I will wipe all tears away. Sorrow and pain shall all be gone, and my name it shall be one. By Yom Hahu, by Yom Hahu. The spear will break and the chariot burn. The hearts of the parents, the children will turn, and children and parents will all turn to you when that day comes. By Yom Hahu. By Yom Hahu, and on that day I will wipe all tears away. Sorrow and pain shall all be gone, and my name it shall be one. By Yom Hahu, 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 by Yom Hahu. Let us pray. Creator God, whose presence sustains us in every circumstance, we return gratitude to you for this time together in praise of you and conversation with our brothers and sisters and friends. We pray urgently for unity and wholeness in your broken world especially in the midst of unfolding violence and the aftermath of terror and loss, we seek the grounding power of your love. In days of fear and division, we need hope. 
We need to believe somehow that you are still writing a story of peace. Help us to believe that a vision in which all nations and religions and tribes and languages dwell together in peace is possible. And may you, O oh God, strengthen those whose lives feel shattered, who are in crisis, who are experiencing loss. May your hope be present in their lives. May you bring the human touch of love to those who have felt unloved. May your light shine into those whose world is covered in darkness. And may you use us to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to give a cup of water to the thirsty, to shelter the homeless. Help us, O oh God, to live into your vision of justice. Give us the wisdom to teach our children and ourselves to love, to respect, to be kind to one another, so that the generations may grow with peace in mind. And help each of us here, as people who have spent time today in this place in praise of you alongside friends and strangers, and strangers having become friends to go out into this world with your desire for peace among all our peoples to inspire our hearts and our actions. It is in your holy name that we pray. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite forward the Interfaith Family Project uh, leaders to share a few words. I seem to be the person always speaking, but I'm speaking on behalf of a, a whole group of people. Uh, and it's a very um, practical expression of our interfaith work together. So I want to start by thanking everyone here who has contributed um, so generously in the past in so many ways, whether it's through money or through volunteer time and a lot of volunteer time and donations of all kinds of material things. I want to thank all of you for, for contributing to um, supporting our extended Afri Afghan family with whom we've been working. We're thankful for making the decision that the offering for today's joint service will also go uh, to the Afghan resettlement activities, most specifically to help with education and workforce preparation and hopefully we'll have enough money to also support um, paying for airplane tickets and, and other things. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, Reverend Gray said, you know, uh, put a note on your donation that it's for the refugee project and you can contribute through any of the three congregations, just note it down. Many of you have asked um, how they're doing and I'll give you an update again about that and uh, the simple answer to all of that is that they're doing very well and well on the way uh, to making a home for themselves in our community and to self-sufficiency. You've also wanted to meet them and luckily we have some of the extended family with us today and I'll introduce you to them um, as well. So I'll start with the part of the family that's been here the longest. Um, the Karimi family, uh, Zabahula, um, who's right here. Uh, right, right, wait. So, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm going to introduce you. So, I'm going to go through each one of you separately. So, and uh, Hasina and Farhan and Muda, so that's the the family that's been here. Farhan is here. Farhan, do you want to stand up too? Say hi. 
Um, they've been in country now seven months. That seems like a, a long time. Uh, Karimi, um, or Zabi, however you want to call him, is working full time and is going to school in the evening as part of his uh, heating and air conditioning apprenticeship program. Hasina and Mudasir, unfortunately not here today, are learning English really well and part of a two-generation English language and parenting program that they've been part of. Fahan is a first grader in Luxmore Elementary School and excited about learning English. And I see a smile on his face, so I think he actually <laughs> understands some of this. Um, Esan, who is Karimi's brother, uh, unfortunately is not with us today. Well, fortunately, he's, uh, he has a part-time job while he's also going to school, and this is one of the times he's working. Um, Esan is enrolled in Montgomery College and taking a course leading to A-plus computer certification. Um, and he's working part-time at the dollar store at the moment, and it's busy before the holiday season, and he's also being tutored in English. Mubarak and um, Olfat and um, little Golan, who's in um, playing with the other little children today, uh, are the Yusufi family. And they're also part of the extended family. Uh, Mubarak is Hasina's brother. And they just arrived uh, two months ago. Uh, and they're still very much involved in startup activities. You can't believe how many startup activities of healthcare meetings and social service meetings and this orientation and that orientation. Olfat is being tutored in English. Um, Mubarak is studying for his driver's license, and we're really getting ready to focus on employment. Um, we'd be thankful for any leads for jobs for Mubarak, as well as for Asan when his uh, part-time job, and so we'd be happy to talk about it. In the interest of time, I've skipped over all kinds of big and small steps along the way that have facilitated uh, that have been facilitated by the dedicated volunteers. And it really does take a village um, and emails and lots and lots of communication. Um, one of the unintended um, pleasures of all of this work is that we formed strong bonds across the three congregate, the church, the synagogue, and the mosque members um, that didn't exist before, and we've really um, have some very strong friendships that are developing from this. I'd like to introduce um, part of the, the leadership team, uh, Nancy Brown, uh, Brigitte Bourget, um, Joan Burns, and Fassel Shirazi, uh, who are all part of the leadership team. And I'd like to turn it over to Brigitte to um, add some additional comments. So as Evelyn said, this initiative would not have been possible without the time and contributions of so many of you. If I were to mention all the names, we'll probably be here uh, and we'd all miss the brunch. So I will mention certain services, and if you would please stand um, and, and remain standing. Please stand if you were part of the housing and furnishing team looking for and finding apartments, uh, collecting furniture, carrying furniture, lending your truck and carrying furniture. Thank you. <laughs> Please stand and remain standing. Please stand if you have welcomed the families, if you took them for outings, provided meals, um, stocked the pantry, oriented them to the area, if you shopped for clothes and hosted and helped with a welcome party at the Sherazis. Please stand if you're one of our dedicated tutor, tutors and who have taken on also so many other activities. Ellen, tutors, please stand up. If you've helped with the driver's license logistics, 
and other bureaucratic challenges of which there are so many, if you've helped with employment services and organized health care, provided dental care, and I also want to recognize our financial team. And then, of course, all the people who've helped with driving. You wouldn't know how, uh, how spotty or, and difficult our public transportation system can be when you have to get from point A to point D, B. Um, please stand if you have given money to, to this endeavor or in-kind donations. Please, please stand if, if you've helped in any way that I have not mentioned. <laughs> please stand if you've prayed for peace in this world and for all of those <laughs> who suffer under war and violence. Now take a look around at your fellow humans and then be seated. <laughs> no. Uh, many of you remember Janet Ballantyne, who um, died this August. She was a force of nature, um, she lived a life of service, and she was instrumental in starting us on this initiative uh, with, with Evelyn and Marty and, and Bruce, the IPC members. So I'm going to close with a prayer that Janet read at our last meeting that she attended. It was shortly after the Science March, and she heard it at the National Cathedral. We, we give thanks for, so Janet, this is for you. We give thanks for microscopes and telescopes and for the people who use them. We give thanks for quarks, which scientists say are the building blocks of hadrons and for other things we don't understand. We give thanks for calculus, which is used to quantify derivatives and integrals, and for other things we have long forgotten. We give thanks for quantum physics and wonder what it tells us, that a particle can be of two states at the same time. We give thanks for anthropology and wonder at what it tells us, at the human state, that the human state is connected to fossil hominids, and to the dust of stars. We give thanks for nuclear power and the power of love. And we pray that we would use one with caution and the other with abundance. We give thanks for Buddhist biolo biologists and Muslim meteorologists, for Sikh psychologists and Jewish geologists, we give thanks for atheist astronomers and Christian chemists, and for Hindu hematologists. We give thanks for grace and peace and kindness and respect. And we give thanks for the ways in which we are bundled together as creatures and as creation. For science and spirit, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Morning offerings now.
thank you for your good to us. We praise you for the opportunity to worship you this day. To use this gift which we encourage in you for your work in the world. And help us to be agents of your love. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to thank you all so very, very much for loaning us your children for this past hour. If these kids are any indication, the future of America is in great, great hands. Um, so what we did upstairs is we discussed the lyrics, what the meaning of the words were to the song that we're about to sing for you. I'm going to have the, their um, comments posted along the hall, but I just want to share one comment that I thought sums up everything amazingly well. And they said, the purpose of this song is that all three religions come together to be friends. So thank you. So. Um, I'm not going to share all of them, but, but we did talk about different customs, different traditions, um, and it was, it was really good questions. Very, very interesting information. So now, we would like to share with you the song and invite you to sing the chorus with us.
our table be ever plentiful and made be spacious always to accommodate one another. We ask the Lord in all of his names and all of his beautiful, beautiful attributes. May he accept from us our pious acts. May he protect the innocence of our children. May he protect our community from hate and violence. And may he always bring us together in praise of his blessed name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And together may the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Let us all share with each other a sign of peace. Gene, peace be with you.